Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Reddit traders at it again, this time rallying around a call to start a hashtag bio war on heavily shorted biotech companies working to cure disease. One working on a COVID drug soaring as much as 36%. This as GameStop falls back down again. Plus, Elon Musk makes his debut on the hot social audio app Clubhouse. He talked about everything from Mars to wiring monkeys' brains and even surprise listeners by interviewing Robin Hood CEO Vlad Tenev himself. Clubhouse co-founder and CEO Paul Davison joins us this hour. And talk about a stock story, Okta shares up 100% how the company is helping keep workforces secure as the pandemic continues and why they're now telling employees they can work from home forever. CEO Todd McKinnon will be my guest. All those stories in a moment, but first, U.S. stocks had their biggest rally in about 10 weeks as several strategists said the recent explosion in speculative buying will not derail the bull market in equities. Let's get straight to Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow with the latest. Lots of uh, curiosity about how the market would open today. Walk us through the day, Eric. Ed. Yeah, a positive day and JP Morgan leading those voices saying they're not seeing any of the excessive leverage, excessive momentum in stocks that would give them cause for concern based on their models. The big picture, the big story that U.S. equities rallying on Monday led by tech, the S&P 500 up 1.6 percent. But you can see very easily the outperformance in technology stocks, the Nasdaq 100 up two and a half percent. The Philadelphia Semiconductor Index up almost four percent, best day since November 5th election week. And really a part of the story here is those big cap tech stocks. Look at the NYSE Fang Plus Index up 3%. Of course, we're waiting on both Amazon and Alphabet, the Google parent company, to report earnings on Tuesday. And as you and I have discussed, Emily, going into this earnings period, there was this big expectation that we would see outsized earning growth from those mega cap tech stocks. But the Reddit story, the, the retail trader story does not go away. Look at GameStop out down 30% on the day. Extreme volatility still in those stocks. Another Reddit favorite, AMC Entertainment, though, basically flat, little action. So in terms of where those day traders and retail traders are turning their attentions, wow, what a story in silver. Over the weekend, that's where the money was going. In fact, silver jumped to an almost eight-year high, extending this surge that started with that retail frenzy. The most active futures you can see on your screen rose as much as 13% earlier Monday to about $30.35 an ounce. That's on the COMEX, the highest level since February 2013. They've come away a little bit since then, but that's the new hot pick for all of the keyboard warriors on Reddit, Emily Silver. Right. And even though the frenzy dying down when it comes to some companies, this whole controversy is still very much in the spotlight. In fact, Elon Musk was in a clubhouse last night and surprised everyone listening. Uh, I know you were listening. I was listening uh, by passing the mic to Vlad Tenev, the CEO of Robinhood, who just happened to be in the room, almost uh, eclipsing the interview with Elon himself, Elon grilling Vlad Tenev. Uh, you know, what was your takeaway from that? Yeah, I mean, he put him on the spot and said, tell us what happened. You know, there were rumors that some of the market makers had put pressure on Robin Hood. Tenev said that just simply wasn't the case. He pushed him on kind of what the big picture was. But it was a very wide ranging appearance from Elon Musk. Count on one man to bring the conversation back. And, you know, he talks not just about Robin Hood and Reddit and what we've seen, but also about Bitcoin, moving the price of Bitcoin for the second time in a single week. He also, what I thought was interesting, had his Tesla CEO hat on and addressed the issues of supplier saying pretty pointedly on the call quote it's important to emphasize to our suppliers we're not trying to put them out of business we want them to increase their rate and i thought that that was really interesting because this is the man who's ceo of a publicly traded company he's also of course the ceo of spacex and Neuralink, both companies that he discussed he discussed spacex's ambitions with regards to going to mars he talks about Neuralink's latest progress they've put their technology into the brain of a monkey that they say is now capable of playing video games via the Neuralink and that they plan to release videos and images of that within a month. He also talks about his own personal life, saying that while, you know, he may be regarded as a, as a genius, it's been very hard for him at times. And this was kind of classic Elon Musk, reflective of him using alternative channels to communicate, mirroring some of the stuff that he says on Twitter from time to time and kind of going outside the realms of what we might expect from the CEO of a publicly traded company, Emily. Elon Musk rarely disappoints, right, Ed? Uh, thank you so much.
uh, for that update. Uh, stick with us in about a half hour. We're going to be sitting down with Clubhouse co-founder and CEO Paul Davison himself. You don't want to miss that conversation talking about the future of the hot social audio app. Meantime, more on Robinhood. Robinhood's biggest backers are plowing money into the online brokerage now at this unprecedented time. Investors led by Ribbit Capital have now poured $3.4 billion into the firm in a matter of days, including $2.4 billion announced today. The cash infusions coming as Robinhood grapples with outraged customers, increased scrutiny from Washington and questions about its plans for an initial public offering. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Annie Massa. Annie, what can you tell us about this additional funding, $2.4 billion on top of a billion last week? It's truly been extraordinary to watch. You saw Robinhood raise an emergency billion dollars last week. Now today, an additional $2.4 billion from their existing backers. It's really been coming in at a wild rate, eclipsing all of the money that they had raised up until that point. Uh, which was around the $3 billion mark already from venture investors. So it just goes to show you how wild the past week has been for Robinhood. Stepping back, the reason that they had to do this has to do with um, the collateral that they have to post at a central clearinghouse for the industry. Amid all of this volatility with GameStop, AMC, and some of these other meme stocks, we saw Robinhood investors frenetically trading and buying these kinds of securities, which resulted in the app, the company, having to put up more collateral at the clearinghouse. You know, we interviewed Vlad Tenev last week and, you know, asked all the questions. He definitively said uh, market makers had nothing to do with their decision to re restrict buying. But even after that, there was just a lot of speculation and, and seemingly not enough transparency from Robinhood about what and why um, they, they supposedly had to do this. Uh, they did put out a, a new blog post over the weekend that, of course, we had this conversation happening with Elon Musk. What is Robinhood actually telling users now? Um, you know, I know that they've narrowed the, the, the number of stocks that the restrictions impact, but you are still seeing some, right, on the platform. That's exactly right. You know, in that interview where you asked Vlad about why they had to put the brakes on purchases of some of those, that handful of really volatile stocks, he was saying this was not at Wall Street's behest. This was a decision that had to do with our risk management. And, you know, in the, in the days since then, they have uh, reopened some trading for those stocks, some purchases with limits, with a cap. And they've been slowly unwinding some of those restrictions that were put in place. The thing is that, you know, uh, like nature, Twitter abhors a vacuum. And really what we've seen is users were so upset that they flooded the, the airwaves with conspiracy theories. So some people are confused about what happened. And it puts Robinhood in this awkward position of having to kind of explain market structure on the fly to millions of users who might have varying levels of familiarity with the whole system that underpins the stock trades that they make. I saw those uh, comments, Annie, hundreds of them in, in response to the interview, a lot of speculation, a lot of unhappy users. Um, how does this impact the company's plans for an IPO? We were expecting them to file potentially soon. That's right. So this is a big question with the IPO for Robinhood kind of hanging in the balance here. It's going to be a question for their investors. Now, they had been targeting a May IPO, and what we'll really have to see in the coming days is whether this enormous capital raise and this unprecedented a period of time for them is going to uh, influence their plans for that initial public offering. All right. Uh, well, we'll continue to follow as you will as well. Bloomberg's Annie Massa, thank you so much for that update. Okay, coming up with almost $200 billion on hand, we're going to look at why Apple is heading back to the bond market and why shareholders might see more cash next. This is Bloomberg.
Apple is selling $14 billion of bonds to take advantage of cheap borrowing costs, tapping the market for a third time since May as it looks to return more cash to shareholders. Until 2020, Apple hadn't borrowed in the U.S. investment-grade market for more than once in a calendar year since 2017. Joining me now are Bloomberg News consumer finance reporter Molly Smith. So, Molly, give us a little Bonds 101. Why is Apple doing this again? It's kind of really why everyone's borrowing right now. It's really just why not. Uh, the money is there. The investors are so eager to lend, especially, especially to a company like Apple that um, it's just such a major issuer in the bond market that you really almost are compelled to be involved in these deals if you're an investor that tracks any sort of meaningful index that Apple's going to be a large part of that. So new issues are a good way to get exposed if you're uh, looking to usually sell out of old holdings of a bond and get into the new ones. They usually come with a bit more of a enticing uh, yield for investors as a reason to buy the new issue. So uh, it just priced actually before we got on and all went pretty well today. So Apple isn't just anyone, though. Why is Apple doing this when they have almost $200 billion in cash on hand? Uh, yeah, I think that's where um, it looks like uh, some analysts have been speculating that the company is going to really ramp up its capital returns this year to shareholders. So that's usually what Apple has borrowed for in the past to fund uh, share buybacks and dividends. And it looks like that's what's going to continue as they try to lower their cash balance down. And um, you know, if you can do that opportunistically when the money is very cheap and pretty much there for the taking, it makes sense. So what does this mean for shareholders, for you know the folks on the other end? What sort of windfall might they see? Um, I mean, the actual debt issuance itself doesn't really mean much for an Apple shareholder. For companies that are less credit worthy than Apple is, you know, this could maybe be something you wouldn't want to see that the company is taking on more debt. But Apple certainly has enough money to service its debt, and that's not an issue from a credit or a shareholder perspective. But I would think that, you know, shareholders have become accustomed uh, from getting these kinds of payouts from Apple. So whether that's coming from internally generated cash or external borrowings, I think they're just happy to see it. So is this going to be a theme this year? Are we going to see more companies do this? As long as uh, the markets stay open uh, and it's a credit that, uh, that bondholders are willing to invest in, um, I would say, sure, why not? Um, it's interesting because usually bondholders don't like to lend to um, companies that are just going to give the cash to shareholders. It's kind of at odds with what they do. Uh, but in the case of Apple, uh, I don't think you really have anything to worry about. The company's going to pay you back no matter what. Uh, so that's it's been a good track record for them, and they've always been able to borrow for this reason. All right. Uh, Molly Smith, thanks for giving us a little bond education. Uh, we'll be watching our Bloomberg News corporate finance reporter there. OK, coming up, famed investor Arlen Hamilton is opening the door to everyone to invest in her VC firm, Backstage Capital. The goal? To change the status quo, where over 90 percent of VC funding goes to white men. We're going to hear from Arlen next. This is Bloomberg. Backstage Capital has invested in over 150 startups led by underrepresented entrepreneurs. Now it's going even bigger. The company has launched a campaign that allows anybody to realize potential gains from Backstage's current portfolio and future rounds of private investments. With this new initiative, any investor can participate in helping Backstage close the funding gap for diverse founders. Joining us now for more, Arlen Hamilton, founder and managing partner at Backstage Capital. Reminder that Bloomberg Beta, the venture capital arm of Bloomberg LP, is an investor in Backstage. So, Arlen, tell us a little bit more about how this campaign works. 
Sure. So it's on republic.co uh, forward slash backstage. You are investing in a Reg CF, a crowdfunding uh, campaign. And when you invest as little as $100, uh, you will enjoy and participate in the upside as backstage the investment entity does. So this is not an investment in a uh, individual company, in our portfolio. It's an investment in backstage itself. And you'll enjoy uh, and participate uh, in the upside of our carry uh, and our management fee. Now, we've been closely following this sort of retail investor revolt, the rise and fall of GameStop, and there seems to be, you know, a fundamental shift in power happening from institutions to individuals and also, you know, continued pushback against sort of the establishment um, and, you know, people wanting their voices to be heard. Tell us more about, like, why you are doing this. What drove sure. this idea? Well, as you said, 90% of venture funding goes into uh, goes into companies led by white men in the United States, where white men make up a third of the country. And so that doesn't really make sense. And a lot of the problem has to do with who is allowed, uh, quote unquote, to invest or who has access to invest in, in this venture capital space. It's a very closed off space. And so since 2015, my fund has been working towards democratizing that and the way we invest in companies. And now today, uh, you know, it's a new day as well. And we'll um, uh, shepherd in a new way of investing as an LP and as an investor in a venture fund. So how much are you hoping to raise? What kind of uh, startups uh, are you looking for? Sure. So this is an investment in our operations and across our uh, three phases last about a couple of months, I believe, in the Reg CF and a Reg D 506C will raise about $10 million. The first uh, tranche of that is this first million that is available right now. And we've already, uh, in the last three hours, passed about 400,000 of that first million and uh, more than 600 investors. And it's just about five or 10 investors per minute. Now, when you started in this game, there were folks out there who, you know, said you wouldn't live up to the hype because you weren't playing the game like everybody else was. Right. Now that you are in this, you've been in this for a few years. Tell us, tell us what progress you've made. How well are your best companies doing? Sure. So we, we invested pre-seed stage, so it's, it's a long uh, horizon for returns. But we've had some of the companies that we invested maybe $25,000, $100,000 in before they'd raised a million uh, go on to have revenues in the tens of millions, go on to raise tens of millions, upwards of closer to $100 million each. And it's not the only way to measure success is how much a company can raise. But to go from a company not even being able to get into a room with an investor and now they're being evaluated at or valued at uh, 200 million 300 million plus it shows you the the trajectory that we're on so i believe in the next decade you'll see backstage not only uh, have a lot of these success stories go on but you'll see us have hundreds of millions of dollars uh, under management and um, and some of our companies will go on to be the unicorns. And we also enjoy the companies that don't make it to unicorn. We are we're very founder friendly and we think that we think about it as a cash on cash. So if we put a dollar in and you can bring us back 10, uh, we don't care how you got there. Now, there's been so much momentum behind the Black Lives Matter movement. We have, you know, the first woman of color, vice president of the United States. We have people like you trying to make change in VC. How much change is actually happening on the ground, mm -hmm. in the trenches, for people of color who are starting companies and need funding? I think it's on a week by week basis. You know, last year there were all these people who came out, all these corporations came out with manifestos and what they were going to do. And a lot of them lost interest really fast, but some of them have stayed the course. I think you're seeing that on the ground. You're seeing uh, companies that I, that I admired um, still in that movement. Um, and, but for the founders, you know, we're going to make do no matter what. We're, we're not going to sit around and wait for other people to figure it out and these institutions to get their act together. So what I see is, yes, there are institutions who are doing the right thing and, and catching up to, frankly, their, you know, for their own good. But there are more people who are individuals, the crowd, who I, again, am reaching with, with this raise, who are just taking it upon themselves to say, look, we're either going to bootstrap or we're going to go for alternative uh, uh, funds, 
ways of capital, um, or we're going to band together and, and, and do things that you're seeing right now where the crowd is taking over. So, you know, you told me in the past you would let the next Mark Zuckerberg walk away. You're not interested in investing in anyone who looks like Mark Zuckerberg. So, so let's talk about the folks that you are backing. You know, what is one company, if you could pick one, to, that, that you would say we need to keep our eyes on, the biggest success so far in the backstage portfolio? Those are two questions. So I won't say they're the biggest success because we have a lot are in stealth that are successful, but there is a company called uh, Akash that um, is doing satellite. They're, they're competing against Starlinks and um, they're also providing uh, uh, equipment for a Starlink. So I think they have a pretty smart model. But we met them 2017 before they had raised a million dollars, put $25,000 in, kept in touch, helped where we could. Uh, we just put $1.5 million into their to subsequent rounds. They've raised more than $20 million. I think there'll be a, a unicorn within the next three years, if not sooner. And um, if they win, we all win because they get more broadband to more places that don't have it. And, uh, you know, the, the sky literally is the limit when it comes to them. So, uh, you know, we've been through a tough year. Are you hopeful about 2021, you know, when it comes to VC and uh, trends? How is this year going to be different than last? I'm hopeful because it's like it seems like there's a reckoning happening right now. It's, I don't know if it's because, uh, you know, today I'm just in a very good mood, but it seems like things <laughs> people are taking into their own hands, you know, and this is this is a win. Like this is an example of a win for all of us, like all boats rise and there are people who want to collaborate. Those people are coming to the fore. And it's not just about the few dozen people who may have access to LPs right now. It's about you know, really celebrating these founders um, who day after day after day okay. are in the Well, thank you for bringing us some hope. Arlen Hamilton of Backstage Capital, good to have you back on the show. Reminder, Bloomberg Beta, venture capital arm of Bloomberg LP is an investor in Backstage. Okay, coming up, the hottest platform in social media right now, getting a huge vote of confidence from Elon Musk. Clubhouse co-founder and CEO Paul Davison joins us next to talk about explosive growth on his new live audio platform next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. When the private social app Clubhouse debuted in March, it almost instantly became the hottest topic of Silicon Valley intrigue and fascination. It's still invite only, but now over 2 million users have joined the live audio platform, including Oprah, Drake, and most recently, Elon Musk. The Tesla CEO gave a lengthy interview Sunday night, ranging from wiring a monkey's brain to Mars and even surprise listeners by asking the CEO of Robinhood to take the mic and grilling him on trading restrictions. Clubhouse is backed by VC heavyweight Andreessen Horowitz and more. Joining us now, Clubhouse co-founder and CEO Paul Davison. Paul, you've had quite a 24 hours from Elon Musk and Vlad Tenev last night to I'm jumping in there uh, in the middle of the day today and I hear Ashton Kutcher on the platform. I believe you have what, like a 10 person team? Um, yeah, cool. we're, and what is we're next? growing quickly, but we're about that right now. Yeah. So talk to us about your vision here. A lot of people are talking about Clubhouse as, you know, the next big media platform. What does that mean to you? Well, I guess I'll start off with what Clubhouse is. Clubhouse is a new type of social network that is based on voice, where people come together with others to talk and listen and learn from each other all in real time. So when you open the app, you'll see thousands of different rooms and you can jump into any of them and just hear people talking about all sorts of different topics like financial markets and, and crypto and philosophy and hip hop. And uh, if you want, you can just sit back and listen or you can raise your hand and participate. And, and the idea is that it, it, it's a place that's about connecting authentically with other humans. You know, if you think about voice, it's relatively new in the world of social networking, at least in the US but it is the oldest medium. We've been gathering with other people and talking for as long as civilization has existed. 
it, it's something that's, that's really human. And so our goal is to create a, a new type of network that's more about those authentic human connections than about gaining likes or follows. And we found that voice is a really powerful medium. It's definitely uh, an, an, an intimate and, and a different kind of experience. It's hard to describe it until you go in there. Um, I did try to get into the Elon room last night and at like a split second after it opened, it was already filled with 5,000 people. <laughs> then there were all these other rooms that were full with thousands of people. Um, it is invite only for now, but I've noticed that you have been increasing invites. It seems like quite dramatically in recent weeks. Is that by design and, and how soon will it be open for everyone? You know, from the earliest days, we've been designing Clubhouse for everyone. And our goal is to open it up as fast as we possibly can. The only reason it's not open to the world yet is because, you know, as you mentioned, um, we've historically been a small team and we just want to make sure that the experience scales before we open it up. We, we try and make sure that each time a new wave of users joins, the experience for everyone who's already on the app gets better rather than worse. But our goal from day one has to build this for everyone, the diversity, the, the breadth of the community. It's the greatest thing about it. And so we don't know exactly when we're going to open it up, because what we do is we, we sort of turn up the knobs a little bit on invites and watch what happens to the experience and get feedback from our users. And if it continues to scale, then we'll continue to open it up more. So my hope is that we can be open to everyone within you know months, not, not weeks, not years, but months. And we're really excited to get out on Android and to localize it into other languages so that everyone around the world can experience Clubhouse in a way that feels native to them. So will it be like, just like I can turn on the TV and anybody can watch you know, a certain program or turn on the radio, anyone can listen in? Is that, is that what Clubhouse is going to be like? Yeah, and hopefully participate. A really large percentage of people who come in and listen to conversations end up talking as well. And, and that's one of, one of the really nice things about it. You can sit back and be passive. You can multitask. And, or you can participate. And, and the thing about voice, you mentioned this a second ago, it's such a powerful, intimate medium. You know, you have all the intonation and inflection and, and fidelity and bids and asks that, that voice gives you, but without any of the anxiety of video. You don't have to worry about what you look like or, or how messy your house might be. And so people are, are really authentic. And, and it's, it's incredible how quickly you can form connections with other people when you're just using your voice. So, you know, there's been some confusion about whether what happens on Clubhouse is public or private. I know you say you're not allowed to record anything that you hear, but, you know, people were streaming uh, the, Elon's remarks. Um, there's been news reporting on it. People are tweeting about what they hear. Um, where do you draw the line? Well, we, really, we leave it up to the creator. We always say creator first. That is one of our big mantras that we have, and it guides a lot of our product decisions. And so um, if you want to host a big co public conversation, you want to allow people to record it, um, that's fine. You can actually do that with the explicit permission of all the speakers. And if you want to have a more private conversation, then that's fine too. You can kind of think of it like going to a conference, right? Where, where some people might opt to go to the keynote and there's a really impressive speaker and, and she's got thousands of people listening to her. It's not particularly interactive, but it's public and a lot of people like going to that. Then other people go to the smaller breakout sessions that might be more interactive and, and about these niche topics that they're really interested in. And then you have the hallways of the convention center lined with hundreds or thousands of people charging their laptops and introducing their colleagues to each other and having private conversations. And that's where some of the most magical moments happen at a conference where you go to a music festival and you have the main stage and the side stages and thousands of people on their picnic blankets meeting friends of friends. That's what Clubhouse is like. The room is a really flexible container and we leave it up to the creator. If you want to be public, great. But if you want to have a more private conversation, you should be able to control that. There are concerns, though, about hateful content, racist, even radical content. I mean, Facebook hasn't figured out how to moderate and create more healthy conversation in, in almost two decades. How are you going to be able to police and moderate anything and everything that is said in any room at any given time? Well, I think that's a really important question for any social network. And the reality is, if you want to build a product for the whole world, you have to recognize that there are bad actors in the world, and you have to build a product that's durable and can withstand that. So we think about it along three lines. Who are the people that we have internally that have deep knowledge about this and are willing to think about the, the nuances of live group audio and, and how that might be different and where we can do better? What are the policies that we have in place, both externally, like through our community guidelines, our privacy policy and our terms of service, and internally, 
so we can enforce any incident reports that we receive in a, in a consistent way. And the third thing is product. What are the features that we give users, like the ability to block people and have shared block lists and, and the ability to quickly report an incident if they ever happen to see one, and then the internal tools that we build to manage that flow. So it's people, it's policies, and it's product. And the reality is this job is never done. The, the most important thing as a social platform is that you deeply care about it and you prioritize it and you recognize that these things constantly have to evolve so you can stay one step ahead of those sorts of things. Now, you've been building companies for, for a long time. You've got experience with a lot of different investors. Um, it seems like Andreessen Horowitz has really stepped up here. Um, another entrepreneur tweeted today, David Lieb, I can't think of another startup whose investor has had such an early impact on breakout success. You've got Mark on there, Ben on there, Ben's wife Felicia on there. Um, where would uh, Clubhouse be without them? And, and do you think this will put pressure on other Silicon Valley investors to step up? Boy, um, they've been phenomenal partners to us. We had high expectations and they've exceeded them tenfold. And, and you know, not to mention Chris Lyons and Nate Jones and, and Sonal and, and, you know, their, their internal teams, they've just been wonderful partners to us. And, um, uh, you know, I think that, I, I hope it inspires other people. I mean, I, we couldn't have asked for a better partner. And so we just announced recently that that we raised another round of funding also led by them. And we're just really grateful for everything that they've done for us. Um, you know, and, and they played an important role. Um, I think the user community is, is another group that, uh, that I would be remiss if I didn't recognize. I mean, the Clubhouse is nothing without the user community and it's everything with them. They've been so thoughtful and so helpful with their feedback, um, you know, with their suggestions, uh, by, you know, helping us build a diverse, welcoming and inclusive community. It, it's groups like, like both of those that have really allowed us to do, uh, you know, what we've done so far. And we couldn't do any of this without either of them. So speaking of somebody in the user community, Jessica Lesson, the founder of The Information last night tweeted, so Elon Musk tells the world he'll be on Clubhouse tonight, but many reporters can't listen in because Mark Andreessen, Clubhouse's biggest investor, blocks them. So yeah, really time to think about powerful people who have, uh, the who can shape the, the, the narrative exactly as they want. Um, you know, Twitter allows folks to block people. Um, it's often used to combat harassment, but, but what is your response to that? Well, you know, it goes back to our policy of creator first. And, um, you know, the reality is there are times when you're dealing with live group audio where the wishes of the creator, and that just means the person who started the room, anyone can be a creator, but the wishes of the creator can be at odds with the wishes of the listener or a would-be listener. You know, it could be that you're hosting a room and someone wants to be there, but you don't want them to be in that room because you want it to be more intimate or, or they want to be on stage and you don't want them to be on stage. My co-founder Rohan and I decided early on that if there ever was that tension, we would prioritize the creator. And we think it's better for everyone if you can build a product that works for creators. That's why we want to invest in creator monetization and, and other features to make sure it's a great experience for them. And so like I was saying with the conference analogy, there are going to be people that want their conversation to be broadcast to the whole world. And there will be people that want to have a smaller, more intimate conversation. And, and we believe that as a creator, you should be able to decide that. So how do you plan to make money and how do those monetization efforts scale? So we're really excited about the idea of um, monetization, not for us, but for our creator community. And, and again, I mean creator with a lowercase c, just people who start rooms, who host conversations. There's so many incredible people on Clubhouse and in the world who are smart, who are funny, who have domain expertise, who, who are just great at bringing people together and hosting conversations. I um, mean, you see that in our community, like you know, Bomani and Kat and Francine, later, all of these amazing people who, who are doing that every day. And we want to allow them to be able to earn money directly from listeners who are happy to pay them for their experiences that they're creating. And that might be subscriptions. It might be ticketed events. It might be the ability to tip someone to say, thank you for bringing this conversation together. We're really excited about doing that. We think it just aligns incentives properly. It, it gives people a reason to come on the platform and to host great content and everyone benefits from that. So um, we're planning to invest in that and to do it sooner rather than later. And, you know, we're in such an interesting time right now where people have sort of more uninterrupted time at home. They can listen in when we get to a new normal, when, you know, typical Silicon Valley networking events come back. Does Clubhouse growth 
uh, continue or, or do you see a change in behavior? Uh, we think that voice is a durable medium. My co-founder Rowan and I have been interested in it for a very long time. We started this company in, in late 2019. And I, I just fundamentally believe that a lot of the best technologies that I've seen before um, have taken things that, that we've always enjoyed doing in the real world, natural human things, and they've just made it easier to do that. Right, so I don't think Amazon's gonna go away after the pandemic. I don't think Tinder will go away as a way to meet people because they've taken things that are, that are natural things. We've always done offline, buying things, dating, um, and they've just made it easier to do that. So for us, the, the idea is that if we can give anyone in the world instant access to meaningful conversations, to meaningful human connections, no matter where you live, no matter what networks you have access to, what your economic situation is, you can be in the room, you can pull out your phone and instantly have uh, you know, a group of wonderful people who are super thoughtful, talking about something that's interesting to you, engaged in a, in a meaningful conversation. And if you want, you can be part of that. Okay. We think that's a durable thing and, and, and we think that will continue. All right, we will be watching. Paul, thanks so much for joining us. Paul Davison, Clubhouse co-founder and CEO. All right, coming up. Technology grew at its fastest rate ever over the last 12 months, fueled by the pandemic as workforces rushed to work remote. We're going to look at some of the top performing platforms and what the future holds for remote work with the CEO of Okta next. This is Bloomberg. Last January, no one could have predicted the role technology was going to play over the next 12 months, including Okta, which releases a new report on workplace trends every January. This year, cloud and cybersecurity are among the fastest growing businesses as companies continue to work remotely. For more on our special work shifting series, I'm joined by Okta co-founder and CEO Todd McKinnon. So Todd, nobody knew how 2020 was going to play out, but we have a better idea of 2021 now that we are here. Um, what surprised you most about the last year? Oh uh, yeah, it was a crazy year. I, I think so for, for the viewers, Okta is an identity company. So we connect people to the technology they use at work or our customers, customers to their websites. So we get this unique view in terms of the data on what people are using. So we expose that in an aggregated way um, to, to let the industry and our customers and the market know about the trends and what people are using and what people are finding success with in this crazy time. So that's the context for the report. And as you mentioned, this is our seventh annual report and it did not disappoint. If you look at the top fastest growing applications, nine out of the top 10 are totally new, including number one, which is Amazon business, right? You know, Amazon has a lot of great products, but they're not necessarily known for the business purchasing application, which we saw rocket to the top of the chart. So you, you, people want to buy a new work from home setup to be productive in remote work. Amazon biz, the business helped them do that to the tune of about a 300 plus percent growth rate in the last year. So Okta shares have been up 100% uh, over the last year, in part because there are more companies out there that want to protect um, the work that their employees are doing, whether they're using Slack or Salesforce or Zoom. What do the next 12 months look like to you? Well, I think what we've seen is the pandemic and working from home accelerate trends that have been in motion for many years, the trend of more cloud applications, the trend for every organization to have to become a technology company in the sense that they need to build their own websites and mobile apps to compete with their, their digital competitors, their offline competitors that are getting online. And then the third thing, as you mentioned, is every company has to be great at security. And if you look in the report, we actually see a lot of interesting data about security. So if you look at all the industries that, that Okta serves, higher education and education in general is the most threatened industry. So we see um, emerging threats against that uh, group of organizations at about twice the re rate of banking and finance. So um, everyone's got to deal with security and education organizations have to deal with it, according to our data, more than most. So speaking of cybersecurity, in the wake of the solar winds breach, you know, ha has there been an increase in demand for cybersecurity? And, you know, what can you say about the your, your outlook there, given this new and it sounds like very dangerous threat landscape. 
Yeah, I mean, the threat, the threat landscape is dangerous. It has been for a long time. And as organizations are trying to take advantage of all this n- new, modern, innovative technology, uh, you, we talked about the top 10, all these great new modern applications like Figma and Miro, which are collaboration applications, Lattice HR. I mean, there's all kinds of innovation out there. And it's easy to use, it's highly accessible, it's from the cloud, but that means more security risks. So when you look at something like a SolarWinds breach, everyone's looking at their own infrastructure and saying, hey, I thought the cloud was the way to go, but maybe you know that was an on-premise uh, legacy system attack. Maybe the cloud is even gonna come into my organization faster because of this. And maybe the cloud can even make me help more sec- be more secure. So you get that benefit of easier to access and more security and that's going to be the impact of, of this breach and in general move to people want to take advantage of more cloud computing. All right, uh, well, I urge everyone to check out that report on workplace trends. Todd McKinnon, Okta co-founder and CEO. Thank you so much for stopping by. Okay, coming up, signs pointing to a strong fourth quarter from Amazon despite costs related to COVID. We're going to talk about the results and what's ahead with Tom Forte of DA Davidson next. This is Bloomberg. Big Tech Earnings continues. Amazon set to report fourth quarter results Tuesday after the bell with analysts optimistic about holiday sales, but keeping an eye out for uh, rising fulfillment costs and the impact of COVID-19. For more, I want to bring in Tom Forte, senior research analyst at DA Davidson, who has a buy rating and a $3,800 price target on Amazon. Tom, what's your what's your outlook for Amazon this week? Yep, so my outlook is that the December quarter should be nothing short of amazing. We know they delivered 1.5 billion items to consumers during holiday. The big question in my mind is, having watched Apple deliver an incredible December quarter and give favorable comments on the March quarter and the stock go nowhere, uh, will Amazon fall victim to the same situation? So uh, what do you think the, the impact of the pandemic and how it continues to play out will be as the vaccine is rolling out, but slowly? I think it's a great question for Amazon. And I think there's good news for Amazon to the extent that you're seeing elevated demand for e-commerce. And there's bad news for Amazon to the extent that the company has not been able to meet this elevated demand. Therefore, they're losing customers to Target, Walmart, uh, to Wayfair, to Overstock, to Etsy, to eBay. And at the same time, the company is doing a balancing act on healthcare, where they're spending billions of dollars to protect their employees from COVID, hundreds of millions of dollars to test their employees for COVID. And at the same time, they're rolling out healthcare related services, like Amazon Pharmacy, uh, their Halo uh, connected device. So I think it's a, you know, the pandemic is good news for Amazon. It's represented a lot of opportunities but it's also bad news, incremental costs, and basically giving competition customers. Plus, how much of our e-commerce behavior actually sticks in a new normal? Like maybe in the last nine months, I've been buying all my paper towels on Amazon, but when can I I can go to the grocery store, maybe I'll buy them there. You know, how much is that a, a risk factor in the near term for them? It's a risk factor But unfortunately, when you think about the slower than expected rollout for vaccines and things of that nature, I think that when it all is said and done, um, we're going to have an elevated e-commerce spend further into 2021 than we initially expected. I think we had all thought that by July 1st, there'd be some sort of return to normalcy, but I think it's going to take longer than that. So you might be buying those paper towels from Amazon for a little while longer in 2021. All right, Tom Forte, DA Davidson, thanks so much. Forget us your forecast. Of course, we will be all over Amazon results later this week. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Bloomberg Daybreak Asia is coming up next. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.